We're good. So, uh, two cameras? Two cameras. Yeah. We used to do shit with one, but then we ended up having a little bit more of a budget, and we're like, all there right, let's get an upgrade <laughs> real quick. All right, we're good? Man, Toast to Life podcast, another Monday. We don't miss, so I appreciate every single one of you guys tuning in. I hope you could take gems from this conversation that we're about to have with one of the most talented tattoo artists in the game right now, TikTok, Instagram. You see him tattooing famous people to people on the street by giving back Mr. Herschel in the house, baby. Let's go. What's up, everybody? People know you as Herschel, right? Your close friends, like you just said. Yep. And then everybody on social media, Mr. Rock and Roll G. That's right. <laughs> yeah, my name's Herschel. Rock and Roll G actually comes from an oldie. I tell people this all the time. So the song originally is uh, Rock and Roll Gangster by Elon. It's a song from the 70s, and that's the origin of Rock and Roll G right yeah. there. Owner of uh, Pachuco Tattooing? Pachuco Tattoo, that's right. Okay, for the people that don't know what Pachuco means, what, where's that origin from? So a uh, Pachuco is a... Basically, a, a, a subculture from the 1930s. It originated in uh, El Paso, Texas. Made its way out here to East L.A. And it was basically, uh, again, a subculture. They were the Mexican-American youth, Chicanos. And they basically had uh, their own lingo, a certain way of dressing, which was pachuco, wool, zoot suits. Yeah. And uh, that's basically what a pachuco is. And I feel... Chicanos today, I myself, I'm a modern-day pachuco. And uh, I'm big on traditions and... That's where Pachuco Tattoo comes from. And so not just like inspired. not just like the quinceañeras. When <laughs> <laughs> that, the, at first, like when when I seen like the name of, of your shop, I was like Pachuco. I was like, where do I remember this from? And I was like, oh, the suits when you for quinceañeras, you know, certain style, certain look. But you just said something. You're the modern day Pachuco. Yes. Why do, Why do you say that? Like, what what traditions that you you go by that you incorporate in your life right now? I mean, the world the, the world's changing, right? Definitely. And, um, you know, uh, I, I was raised in the in the 90s, and uh, world's a different time now. Certain things that, like, I'll give you an example, the Pachuco cross, right? Yeah. It has three points on the cross. It can be interpreted into different meanings. One could be, which is a negative uh, version of it, which is mi vida loca. And I'm trying to transform that. I'm trying to, you know, turn it more into a, a positive symbol. And for me, it's unity, pride, respect. Mm. Those are those the, the three points on the cross there. And, yeah, those are just, you know, uh, uh, beliefs and things that, that I want to pass on, pass on to my children, anybody that watches. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I'm really trying to do is, is paint a pachuco, a Chicano, somebody that looks like me in tattoos in a positive light is what I'm trying to do. So. Yeah. Do you think having or now society, I mean, it's been for a while too, right, because we were just talking about, me and Dylan were talking about this the other day where you get us as Hispanics, you get one tattoo, and what does your mom say? Me mataste. <laughs> <laughs> no, olvídate. Like they, you know, because it's like your body is a temple, your skin is 100%. a temple. You know, you got to make sure that what you have in your body is a representation of you, right? So if you see someone with tattoos out in the street, oh, he's into something. He's a bad guy. He's cholo. Cholo. Mm -hmm. You're pretty much covered. Yeah. There's a couple spaces there free, yeah, free open, no, right? I, yeah, I definitely have space. And uh, I'm definitely mom and grandma's worst nightmare. <laughs> you know, when I meet my uh, my friend's parents or, or grandparents, it's, yeah. it's always like, oh, les el que tatuajes. And I'm like, oh, oh, you know, don't introduce me to that way. But um, I think it's, it, 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 it's cool because in the beginning, initially, you might see me that way. And then I feel like once you start talking to me, you just... Don't start, you know, you, you stop seeing the tattoos. Yeah. Do you think that's that's one, how you're saying, kind of incorporate everything we're saying right now, that you're also trying to change at the same time that you're covered in tattoos, head to toe, but there's more to you than just the ink on your body? 100%. 100%. How do, how do you, what's the one thing that you can probably, like, give game to, like, either the older generation and younger kids that are trying to get tattoos? Because... Bro, I coach high school, and some kids at 15 years old already tatted. Yeah. And they're either on the arm or on the leg. I'm like, man, I would have been dismissed right away by my parents. But it's now seeing, like, how generations are transforming, is there any sort of, like, advice that you can kind of give, give game to these kids? 100%. Take your time on it. Uh, of course, that's what you don't want to hear. When you're young, speaking – you know, I actually got tattooed at 16, mm. so I'm not one to talk, but definitely <laughs> definitely take your time on it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I see that today, people that, and you're right, I meet 18-year-olds that already have sleeves, and what happens is, 
once they're in their 20s, they want to rework those sleeves. They, they, you see this with ball players a lot of time, right? Mm. A lot of before they hit the league, they have not that great work because they're just trying to get covered. Yeah. So definitely take your time on it. Definitely uh, be mindful of where you're going to place them. Don't rush into getting visible tattoos so early. Even myself, I always wanted visible tattoos. My uh, One of my uncles was a tattoo artist growing up, and he was part of the inspiration. I okay. didn't know it at the time, but he definitely inspired me to be a better artist and eventually become a tattoo artist. You grew up in the city of Orange, right? I'm from Orange County. Orange County, my business, the tattoo shop, is in the city of Orange, but uh, I'm from Anaheim. Uh, Anaheim, uh, born and raised. Man, was culture, you say raised in the 90s, was culture in the 90s different than what it is now for you? Even being on, because like when, even being totally honest, we look at Anaheim, like there's different parts of Anaheim. Mm -hmm. There's the Disneyland Anaheim, yep. and then there's the Hispanic Anaheim. Like, 100%. Just, and it's just split by different, uh, different uh, streets. So, like, your upbringing, you just said your, your uncle was a t tattoo artist. So was tattoos normal already in your family during, growing up? Tattoos were normal in my family, but they were looked at negatively. My, my uncle was a cholo, gangbanging in the 90s, him and, him and my, his brother, my, my other tío. And originally, yes, tattooing was looked at negatively because my uncle was a cholo. He was tattooing other cholos. Mm. And... For I feel like in the eyes of my family, they seen tattooing just like part yeah. of the, the cholo lifestyle. Yeah. So it, it was around me, and my uncle was tattooing my my mom, not my mom, my 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 tia, my dad. So he was tattooing close family members, and I remember he used to bring over clients, and he'd tattoo out of my mom's kitchen sometimes. Oh, so I would see that, and I've always been an artist too. So I, I knew at a young age, uh, art was going to be something that I wanted to pursue. But in did life. you know That's, it was going to be tattooed? No, never, never. I uh, I just knew that I loved art, and uh, I also wanted to do cartoons, animation, comic books. That's the stuff that I enjoyed drawing. Yeah. But um, I mean, I, I'm I'm thankful because I've always had a lot of I have a lot of passions. There's a lot of things that that uh that i love doing and art has been the one thing that i've always that's always been my my number one so. so would you say like art in general not just tattooing but in painting drawing is one of the things that just kinds of like your you get to go away from the world a little bit when you get in you get that that pen that pencil that paintbrush whatever and you literally just start going do you block is that like your one of your sanctuaries or what is a sanctuary for you? No, that, that definitely is because it forces you to focus and specifically tattooing because when you're working on art, when you're working on a physical art piece or a project, you can leave that project, come back to it the next day, right? Yeah. When I, when I do a tattoo, most of my tattoos that I do, except if they're large scale, yeah. they're one shot and done. So I'm focused to sit with you, tattoo you for eight to 10 hours. So yeah. in that time, of course, we're getting conversation and, and I love talking to people. I love hearing people's stories, meeting people of all walks of life. But yeah. when I'm tattooing you, aside from the conversations that we're having, there's a lot of time where there's no speaking, right? Where mm. to just be listening to music. And in those yeah. times, I, I definitely do. That is my, my form of uh, meditation there. That's where I'm alone with my thoughts. Mm. And uh, I, I definitely, that is one of my escapes, 100%. What, is, what goes on through your mind when you, when you have that silence between you and your client when you're tattooing, you're in your music, what, what kind of thought process happens there? The number one thought process, or the, my number one thought first is the client experience. I want to give my client the best experience possible, right? Give oh, them a good tattoo. Away, for, away from your client. Uh, away yeah, from like my client. you. Like, when we come and do a podcast, mm -hmm. just to kind of give you a background, like, this is my therapy, right? Like, I get to now share whatever message has been at me the, this whole week that I, I get to say now. When I'm at the gym, we said this other day. I get to block out all the noise. I focus on everything that's happening in my head, which is the voices that get a little loud. And I'm like, all right, today I got to win, right? Today I got to do something to put me forward. Even when I'm coaching, when I'm coaching my high school kids, like I have to get in one zone mentally to be like, I need to perform and I need to be at my best. So whatever I'm going through, I let it go right now, right? And once I step off, I'm good. So when you have that, that silence, what do you focus on for you, or what's your thought process? My thought process is, first off, I'm, I'm thankful to do what I love, right? I'm excited Definitely. to go to work, and those things excite me. You know, you, th you think about life. Why am I doing this? Mm. What's, uh, yeah, why am I doing this? Who am I, do who am I doing it for? And uh, what's, what's the goal? Wow. 
why. Yep. But it's funny that you say, you know, when you're talking podcasting yeah. or when you're doing a podcast that this is therapy for you. I, yeah. I agree because as soon as you said that, I think about the conversations, the exchanges and the advice is the, the advice that I give to people. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when I'm telling people the advice or my thoughts, I'm actually telling myself. Ooh. And uh, I think that's one of the beautiful things. What's the best piece of advice you gave someone that was the best for you? Keep going. Si se puede, you know, anything is possible. That's, that's the secret. I always tell people is the secret is you don't stop. So at, at one point before opening your tattoo shop, did you want to stop this, this journey of being a tattoo artist? Sure. Especially in the beginning when you're doing, when you're doing something and you're not making any money off of it. Mm. Right. It's like, what, what am I doing this for? Yeah. And, uh, so of course, yeah, when you're not making money on things, when you're investing money, you're losing money. Those are those points where is, is it worth it? Am mm. I on the right track? Should I be doing something else? And, uh, I think that's why it's always important to, to do what you love. Right. Yeah. I tell this to people all the time. If you do what you love, can't go wrong. Can't yeah. go wrong. Enjoy the journey. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, it's just a never ending journey. Enjoy the process. Yeah. Cause it, when you when when we talk about like passion, right? When we talk about loving loving what you're doing, like you'll do this for free. Exactly. Like whether it's a year, two years, three years, like you're doing it because you know at one point your gift, your passion is gonna pave the way for you. It's just right now you're in that in that beginning stage where like I'm a big believer in in the higher power and God and like of course. even uh Pepe had told me before, like on the tough months that we have, it's like he's testing you. How bad do you want this? Mm-hmm. Do you really want it bad enough, or are you just saying it so you can sound cool and motivated? No, no. Like he's gonna put you test trials, right? Definitely. So, when you started tattooing, were you already a good artist, like on people's skin? I've always been an artist, so I've always gotten awards at school for for drawing. But was was mm-hmm. is it easy? Like uh, from going from whatever canvas to now actual skin? Not at all, man. <laughs> no, not at all. It's a different. It's a living canvas. It, yeah. it's breathing. It's moving. It's not a perfect flat surface. So yeah, yeah no, it, it it took a it took a while of uh, of practicing and again making money until I made money off of tattooing. So I just loved it. When, as soon as I started getting tattooed young, and that's what inspired me to start tattooing. Yeah. And um, as soon as I started tattooing it just became uh, an obsession and I'm still obsessed with uh, not just tattooing but just the the grind the vision and and I think it's a weakness and a curse but yeah I'm just uh, uh, obsessed with keep moving forward right? do you think What's you need next? to be obsessed with you your passion to, right? I definitely think you do yeah we we're talking about it in, in the sauna with with he's I guess he's a uh, upcoming artist and one thing I think we all have in common when you're in your in your grind and your passion is in order for you to succeed, you have to be obsessed, meaning you're going to have to give up a lot of stuff. You're going to miss out on a, on a lot of things with your family, friends, loved ones, and you're going to have to isolate sometimes because in order for you to function at the highest frequency, well, you got to be away from people because, you know, right now we got to work, but they want to go party. What are we going to do, party or, or do what we need to do? Well, I got to do this. Yep. Sorry I'm boring, but <laughs> this is where I got to be, you know what I mean? No, you're right. Yeah, it's definitely those sacrifices and – no, you're, you're right, and I, and I think about that, and I have friends, and they'll joke with me, and they're like, man, I, if I want to hang out with you, I have to book a tattoo, and it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> I those are things you. that I feel guilty of, but, you know, they, they, they know what I'm doing. They know, they know the vision, yeah. and uh, just, yeah, we're just moving What was your, your first tattoo you ever got? My first tattoo, funny story. So um, my wife, we started dating in high school. We're high school sweethearts. Me and her got tattooed at 16 and 15. So I got her name. She got my name. That was her first tattoo. We got it done in a, a kitchen, homemade machine, and that's what sparked uh, tattooing for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know at that moment already that was it? As soon as I got tattooed, I'm like, I, I fell in love with that. I got tattooed, and I'm thinking, okay, I can, I can do something with this. No, now, but getting your wife's name. Oh, with her? Yeah. I just met her and we clicked, man. Yeah, no, we mm. met young and um, yeah, we just clicked. In the very moment, it didn't feel like that big of a deal. It's but as an adult looking back on it, I tell people I think it's it's nuts, you know? <laughs> yeah, I have a I have a teenage son and I can't even picture <laughs> him even getting a tattoo. So really, yeah, we we're uh, yeah we we're wild and <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but let me let me paint the picture a little yeah, bit please. a little bit further. So a lot of things were going on at the time. Um, I've always been independent. I started uh, working at age uh, 14, right? Okay. And I started making my own money at 14. 
I meet my girlfriend, and she's having trouble at home. We get these tattoos together. Her stepdad sees a tattoo at her birthday party, and she gets kicked out of her house. So that's my girlfriend. I'm living at my mom's house at the time. We're still in high school, and we get kicked out of the. She gets she gets kicked out of the house, and uh, I just wanted to be there for her. So she got kicked out. I moved. I moved out of my house too. So I left at 16 and a half, and I've never been home. So it's one of those things where I was forced to grow up. That's where tattooing came to be. You know, we're we're renting a, a room. In the beginning, we're staying with an aunt, right? Stayed with family for a little bit, and then we got our own apartment, shared the apartment. We have to split rent. We're going to school. So it's like, I need to work. I'm already working at the time, working at KFC, and um, I start tattooing to make extra money. And again, I didn't make any money off of this for <laughs> years, so it was just one of those things where I just... It's going to pay off eventually. And, and when I say pay off, I'm not just chasing money. If yeah. I was just chasing money, I, I tell people this all the time, I could have done many other things. So what I'm chasing is, is a lot more than money. And I tell people this all the time. It might take me a little bit longer. You know, I'm already older. A lot of people, I see a lot of people that are just starting out and they're, they're killing it. But you can't compare yourself to others, right? So I feel like, sure, sure, I'm, I'm taking the, the stairs, but it's going to be worth it in the end. And that's that faith that I keep, right? Not just to myself. God, family, and uh, again, just keep moving forward. Taking the stairs. Taking the stairs. Mean? What do you mean by that? Versus the elevator, you know what I mean? Yeah, the, the marathon method, right? Yeah. Take your time, build, build a solid foundation versus a sudden blow up. I'd rather take my time and build that foundation than to have <laughs> blow up overnight. Yeah, that, if you don't have a solid foundation, you're going to break. It's going to crumble. And as soon as that happens, how do you rebuild, right? Because... Sure. For a lot of people that are listening in, they may be going through a stage right now where they're in that if part. Do I keep going? Should I stop? Should I just wait for a better moment? It's like, no, right now it's that building stage. Definitely. Where you're trying to build a foundation and it takes time. In order to build a big uh, building, a house, whatever it is, it takes time. Definitely. And plant and seeds. That part. Mm -hmm. The planting seeds, you got you to gotta make sure you show it love. You show it care, you show it attention, and it's going to grow. It's growing a tree. It doesn't happen in a week or in a month. And there's a, what, I think it's the bamboo tree, right, where it takes about, like, five years. That's right. It's just about five. You have to be very patient with the bamboo tree. Yeah, five years. Or even, like, the bonsai tree. Like, mm -hmm. that, that's, right. that's another one, too. That's but right. moving out 16, you said it like it was just nothing. Like, it was just, oh, part of it. It is what it is. But... Wasn't that scary for you? Of course, of course. But I think uh, I've put myself in, in situations where, for example, signing that lease, of course it was scary. Now it's like, okay, I have a, 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 an apartment that I have to pay for monthly. I have no choice but to make that money. Not to mention, right, uh, yeah. cost of living, food, gas. <laughs> but I, I've always, like I said, I've always been a hustler. I used to sell candy too, sell candy in high school. Um, as when I was little, well, I'm going to take it further back. Yeah. So my family, we're from Jalisco, Mexico. We're from Jalisco, Mexico. My, uh, my mom, uh, came here as a, as a, as an infant and she was living in uh, Visalia, uh, further North. My dad comes over here as a teenager and, um, they get together. And from what I hear, they struggled a lot, right? When I was little as, as into my childhood, um, life was, life was okay. You know, I'm talking all the way up until maybe seven, eight life was okay. My mom and dad were happy together. They split up. My mom becomes a single mother, and that's when things change. My dad leaves, and um, I see my mom struggling. I see my mom working every night, and that's, that's what changed me when it comes to I want to grow up. I finally, or I, at that point, I see my mom struggling. I'm the oldest out of all my siblings, so I, you know, I become the man of the house. And that really, it, it changed, and that's, that's why I'm who I am today. I see my mom struggle. My other uncle, uh, he was known as a workaholic, and that was a word that I learned when I was seven, and I like that was like a good way to describe my uncle, and that was a word that I, I never forgot after that. And ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to work. I wanted to help my mom, wanted to make my own money. So I used to help my, uh, my mom's madrina. She used to work at a remate which yeah, is like yeah. a swap meet right yeah, yeah and i used to help with the booth and so speaking to people talking to people selling that really got me out of my shell because i was actually i was i was a quiet kid i was nervous i didn't really like to talk in class and that's why i tell people art for me was my voice originally oh I, I i'd be drawing in class and i'd yeah. make friends like that somebody yeah. would see my art then i have a new friend so early on i saw the things that art can do 
opening doors for me. And then when it came, when it came to actually working, being like a salesman, that that step that pushed me to step outside of my normal anxiety, nervous self. And that got me out of my shell. And I think the same thing. It's made me who I am. So you're introverted. Yeah, 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah. And people think, oh, you're so good on camera and this and that. But I think I am cringy on camera. You know what I mean? I don't even like to watch a lot of my stuff. I might not even watch this whole podcast. I'm playing. I'm playing. But you know what I mean? Like, it happens, though. Like, I, yeah. I tell everyone, it's yeah. like, oh, bro, your pocket. I was like, that's cool. I don't listen to it back, bro. <laughs> like, like, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. there's things that, like, when I look back, I'm like, damn. Like, why the hell did you just say that? Or yeah. why are you sitting that way? Because, again, I think I'm just very self-analytical by myself. I'm sure. very judgmental by myself. Like, it's natural. All right, right? But it's like. If we're not doing this to ourselves, then, like, what's the worst anybody could tell? We already did it ourselves. Like, no mames, I mean, that's gordo. <laughs> You're lazy. Like, you know, one of those things where it's like, I don't need anybody else to say it. I don't need nobody else. I don't need to hear it from anybody else. I've said it. I know it. I'm good. Like, these are things where the self-dialogue ha has to happen. What do you tell yourself every day? What do you feed your mind, your body, your soul, so you're able to function at what everybody sees you? Everybody sees you as the tattoo artist who tattoos athletes, mm -hmm. uh, influencers, singers, rappers, but no one sees what it took for you to just even be on that camera and be that walk them in type of dude. You know what I mean? So Definitely. growing up, you said your life changed at, at seven. And one thing that you said is also is you became the man of the house w without even trying. It's just one thing that just said, here it is. Yep. Now, looking back at that seven, eight-year-old kid, are you proud of that person that was then? Definitely. I had a lot of uh, dreams when I was a kid, and um, I'm blessed, and I'm, I'm so grateful that I've gotten to scratch off a few few things on the list. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Um, what do you tell that, that seven, eight-year-old? Because having – it's a sort of a funny thing, right, when they were like – you. There's it's kind of normal where there's split homes – and one thing that I'm very blessed about, I had both parents in the same home where the person next to me may may not have that same story. Sure. Right? They're the loudest ones. They're the funniest ones. But back home, it, it may be a mess because whatever they're going through. What do you tell that seven-year-old kid that may have been scared, may have been thinking what to do next, not insecure about himself? What do you tell that seven-year-old, eight-year-old kid? I tell myself to keep moving. Don't compare yourself to others. That's uh, I think that's a, a killer for a lot of people is is comparing yourself to other people. I tell myself, love what you do, love what you do, and just enjoy it. Really, everything else will follow. You yeah. be and be your authentic self too. Yeah. Be your authentic self because I, I feel in the beginning, especially when I started trying to be on camera, right? Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I was trying to portray somebody that I thought people wanted me to be. Mm. And uh, I've learned to just be me. That's it. That's it. And so, yeah, be your authentic self. Just be you. Don't try to be anybody else. This, this may be a, a slightly tough question, but I think it's very much needed for our audience that is listening in. Um, when parents split, sometimes the kids take it even harder because they feel like, oh, it was our fault. What could we have done more for our parents not to split? That at one point, did you ever blame yourself? Thankfully, I didn't. You know, thankfully, I did not blame myself. But, um, yeah, I remember the emotions. I remember I wanted to run away. You know, mm. I remember when my, my mom was giving us the news, I, I thought about running away. And I definitely did have a lot of anger. And I didn't feel, I, I didn't blame myself just because at a young age, I knew my, my dad used to drink a lot. So mm. my dad was an alcoholic. And uh, so I got to see a lot of that. So I understood my mom's point of view, yeah. you know. So I think that's the, the main reason. And that's something that because my dad is an alcoholic and I think culturally, like, you know, my family, we're from Jalisco, you know, we're tequila. <laughs> Tequileros, yeah. My, for the first time I got drunk was off tequila. So, <laughs> you know, I try to be aware. I try to be aware of uh, alcohol, you know, definitely. And I've learned to now where I'm at now, I've learned to have a nice balance with it. Definitely. Where in the past, I, I, I did struggle with that. And I think one of, um, there's a few low points in my life. And uh, one of those low points is 2015, uh, I actually got a DUI. So I got a DUI. And uh, we we're celebrating an uncle's birthday. 
And normally, this was before Uber, Lyft, any of that, right? Yeah. The game, we had a game plan. We're going to go out, celebrate our uncle's birthday. We're going to leave the car at our family member's house, which is literally walking distance of the bar. And uh, so that was the plan. We ended up drinking, had a good time that night. And what happened is uh, our family, they got into an argument. Long story short, nobody was able to stay at this at the house. At the house. And at some point in time, we just decided to drive. And I say we, it's me and my wife. So we're, we're driving, driving home, and uh, I'm speeding. And we're almost making it home, literally our exit. I almost missed the exit, and uh, I run a quick right. Oh, yeah. Our car, my car, my truck flipped. And uh, my truck flipped 10 to 15 times off of that, that exit. And, uh, yeah, a lot, uh, it, was, uh, it felt like a dream. Everything was in slow motion. You know when you watch a movie and there's a bomb that went off and you hear that buzz? I remember waking up, and who knows how long we were out for. I was the first one that woke up. And I was in the – I was driving, actually. I was driving. My wife was in the passenger side. And I woke up first. We're upside down. And, again, it sounds – it felt like a a movie. I felt like I was – I felt like I was dreaming. And uh, I woke her up, and we start walking home. This is our exit. We're, you know, a few feet away from getting home. And uh, we're almost making it home, and that's when the ambulance showed up, the police showed up. And we're just grateful because we're alive. Yeah. I went to jail. I got a DUI, went to jail for three months. And I think that's uh, one of those moments in life where, where I wake up and I think about that every day. You know, I'm thankful to be alive. I could be in prison right now for yeah. manslaughter for my wife's death. You know what yeah. I mean? That could have been me. And the reality is, is... That does happen, and I, while I was in jail, I met other people that, unfortunately, it went down exactly Definitely. like that. They killed somebody on accident with a DUI, right? So I'm so grateful and, and um, thankful that, thank God that we're, again, we're both alive and well, and we're still here. And I think about that every day, and I, uh, again, I feel like that's, that's a big, significant moment in my life that changed a lot of things for me. So being in jail three months, I'm in, okay. What do I do now? What do I do after here? I already have a tattoo shop, and I'm just planning out. This is what I want to do. This is, I want to work with these people. I'd like to start this project. And I get out of jail, and it's overtime. I lose my job. I was with the company for 10 years. I was driving a company vehicle, too. So I lose that job, and thankfully, I had tattooing as, I don't want to call it a backup, but I had tattooing, and I just went full force tattooing. And and I feel like that was, again, one of those moments in life that, that really gave me a, a push, but yeah. I'm grateful and I think about it every day. That is a moment in your life that would, I guess you could say it's a life-changing moment where, how you said, you could have, your wife could have lost her, her life. Mm-hmm. You could have lost your life. But going away for those three months, yeah, to some people it's like, it's a punishment, but at the same time, it's one of the things where, shit, we deserve this, right? We did yeah. it to ourselves. We could have made a better choice. Whatever the case would have been, right? But it also allowed you to come and do your tattooing 100% full force, as you said. Full focus, yeah. There's things that happen in our life that are unexpected. Some things we have control over, some things we don't. And at the end of the day, end of that process, you're like, I needed to go through that in order for me to be here now. So as crazy as it sounds, imagine if if that didn't happen, what would have been that? wake up call for you to be like dude trust your gift trust your, you know what i mean and, and i think about that all the time i'm i i tell myself i wonder how long it would have taken for me to let go of this company and focus on on my dream right because yeah, your tattoo so, shop opened in 2011 2011 this happened in 2015 and you were so still working another job I was still working another job yeah okay but w- why as because when people become entrepreneurs they think it's it's linear it's easy. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you become a business owner. You have a business upward trajectory, right? Yep. No, it's a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster. And the reason I was doing it because uh, the company I was working for was a consistent, great paying job with uh, salary, commission. I had a company vehicle. It was hard for me to leave that. Yeah. Right. Especially, I'm, I'm a dad. Right. Yeah. I have kids. It's consistent. And believe it or not, even tattooing, it wasn't making me that much money. So I, I really, I needed to work. You mind if I ask, what was your original starting price to tattoo? 
Free? <laughs> free? Free 99? After yeah. the tattoo shop. What went to open the tattoo shop? Yeah, once I started the tattoo shop, I was doing, you know, 50, 100, 200, $300 tattoos. 300 would be an amazing day for sure. You know, so I had a goal of like 200, things like that. Damn. Um, and now to book with you? Well, I, I do. I, first off, I still do free tattoos. I still do free tattoos. I'll always do free tattoos. Yeah. I have long-term clients that I've been tattooing since I first started that I show love to and give discounts on. But, like, if you go to my website right now, you can book pieces for uh, 1200 2000 uh, 2500 And those are pieces that I can do in one day. So, you know, uh, uh, I, what I do now is I work less days, so I'm able to focus on Less clients, but better quality and a better experience. So mm. before I used to overwork myself, and uh, I'm at a point now where I'm picking and choosing the work that I want to do, and I just I, I love it more, I appreciate yeah. it more, and I feel like you get a better experience and a better end result as far as the tattoo. Do you think when you were going pretty much seven days a week, tattooing left and right, were you losing passion for it at the same time because you were just consistently doing? Yes. Compared to now picking and choosing when and who and what, Instead of like every day, boom, dropping, dropping. Definitely. And that's why you need to find other other things, other outlets, right? I tell tattoo artists all the time, you should, aside from tattooing, find other ways to be creative also. For me, it's it's this, mm-hmm. video creation, uh, being on camera, doing content. That's another love of mine too. So, yeah, find other other things that, that make you happy. How do you find happiness? That's a hard one. Uh, happiness is family for me. Happiness is family. Happiness is uh, work. It really is. Work does make me happy. Uh, so those are really it. Family and work. That's really all I need. Did becoming a dad change your life? And if if so, in what in what positive, negative, and what positive way? Hearing of me potentially being a dad, you know, thinking, hey, I might be pregnant, changed everything. Yes. Mm. Uh, once I knew I had a son on the way, that changed everything also. Because again, I've always been. I've always had a vision. I've always wanted to work. I always wanted to get older and do something, right? Yeah. And after knowing that I had a child on the way, that, of course, it was, it, it lit something in me, and I went even harder. And that happens every time. Every, uh, I, have, uh, I have three kids, and uh, I feel like every time there's a new one, I, I definitely, uh, I'm, I'm going harder than before. What do, what do you it's think? It's not just yeah. about me. What do, you, not, what do you think changes that you probably don't notice, but now looking back, what what's that one or two things that just you change in your life? You definitely become uh, more conscious of uh, who you're hanging out with, where you're spending your time, right? Uh, nice. Am I putting myself in situations where, you know, am I going out? You know, am I going into these house parties where, you know, there's there's stuff going on, right? <laughs> things like that. So I avoid, you know, I, I started avoiding things like that because, again, I have, to, I have to make sure I get home to my family. I have to make sure I get home to my kids, right? Yeah. So those are, those are a few, uh, few things is avoiding who I'm with, where I spend my time. Just, did you trust yourself as a parent from the get-go? Like confident in decision-making, confident in the choices you're making for, for your family and your kids? I tried to. Being the oldest, I felt like I was always, uh, when my mom wasn't around, I was, I was a parent. So I had that experience of just being the, the older sibling. But, yeah. Um, yeah, you just you do the best that you can. I feel like as you get another child, you know, you're, you're bettering, your, you're <laughs> upping your dad's skills, things like that. Especially yeah. when you have a daughter. I grew up with mainly boys. So having a daughter for me changed everything, too. It definitely brings out that, that, that softer side, they the say, right? Side. It, it really does change. I've seen homies where... They're hardcore dudes, and it's, and it's funny because those homies are always the ones that end up having all daughters, right? So it definitely does change people for, for the better, for the better. They're, yeah. they're placed uh, for a reason. It, so. Yeah, because I, I have my daughter, too. Um, she's about to turn two in January, and again, like, you want to have my son and want to be hard on my boy. Like, all right, I, I want you to be tough so the world doesn't knock you on your butt. Definitely. You know what I mean? But with my daughter, I'm like... Damn, like, come here. Like, I got you. <laughs> like, don't worry. No one's going to touch you. Yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, trying to find that balance and raising a boy, but also raising a, a young girl. And it's just like, where do you find that that medium point? You know what sure, I mean? Sure. But you're a business owner, you're a dad, you're a husband. Where's balance? What's the balance? That's my number one problem is balance. That's uh, something that I feel you're never 100% on. It's a constant juggling right because yeah it's not just uh work family but yourself right mm-hmm. where do you find that time for yourself too so yeah it's a constant constant struggle that uh 
I think we all do, right? Is yeah. maintaining that balance. And uh, I think it got easier for me when I learned that, you know what, it's not always going to be easy to balance. And that just makes it easier that <laughs> you can't control those things. It is what it is. It's so. <laughs> but it's a constant juggling game. Yeah. With my son, he's my oldest. He, uh, I realized that with him, for example, I wasn't there a lot. I was always working. So thankfully, when by the time my daughter came, I was able to slow things down. I was able to, you know, thankfully I'm making a little bit more money at that point. Um, I was able to take more time off and uh, was able to just be home more. And now mm. the last few years, especially since the pandemic, I have I feel like I've done a better job of that balance. Because what happens is, is when you're always working, right, especially with like your spouse, your girlfriend, it's just I've noticed that the more I'm away, the more we fight. You know what I mean? Like it really is like that. The yeah. more time I spend home, I feel like I'm closer to my wife, my family. So it's just, yeah, one of those things just to be be mindful of. And it's it's a it's a constant struggle to maintain that balance. Um, I think we said before it's like a teeter totter. Yeah. You show one thing attention, the other the other side drops. Yeah. You switch sides and then the other side drops. So it's just like what are you have to be good with yourself. So in your list of priorities, where do you land? What's what's number one, two, where do you land in that list? At the, at the right at the end. <laughs> yeah, right at the end. So yeah, I uh, I do something where I, I take the personal out of work, and I feel like, I don't know if it's a good and a bad thing, but for me, it's like, if I need to leave, I need to be, be there at the some, at, at that time, no, no matter what, right? It's non-personal, it's, it's just work, but, yeah. you know, I do have to be sensitive to to other people, and, and mm. yeah, just not not be a robot when it comes to those things. When you have a, a tough day, because everybody sees, like, cameras are cool, we're on social media, Cool. Every, how just like business, they think it's just straight up. It's straight. It's a booming thing. You're happy. You have everything in the world. But sometimes you get you get to a point where you have everything, but yet you're still empty. Mm -hmm. And it's just like finding that happiness of what we're doing. Am, am I fulfilling my life? Am I fulfilling myself? Um, so you have those days where, you know, you're not always going to be the most motivated person in the world, the most happiest person in the world. So when you have those type of days. What do you do in order to get back into into that work mode, into that grind mode? Working out, the gym has definitely helped. I feel like, uh, especially even running, I used to hate running. But this year, I became a runner. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I hate running. But uh, I, I've learned to I – lo I love running now. So I think uh, running just clears your mind. It, it, it just starts off your day, right? So I've been practicing that, being, being better with my body, uh, mind, body, and soul – also praying, meditation, things like that, just silence, right? Yeah. I don't know if you've ever tried uh, isolation tanks. Have you tried those? No. Those are really cool. Joe Rogan talks about them a lot, right? They're basically, uh, it's either a room or a pod, and it's uh, sensory deprivation, like therapy. So you lose all your senses. You're in a body of, or a pool of water, and it's salt water, and you can't hear, you can't see, you're floating. So all you're left with is your thoughts, and believe it or not, that's actually really relaxing. It clears your mind because, you know, naturally, you know, we're, we wake up and right away we're thinking social we media, work, what do I have to yeah, do today, get right? On the phone quick. A million yeah. thoughts come into us every yep. day, right? Nonstop. And, I, and I've noticed that whenever you, you, you do the isolation tanks, it slows that down a little bit. Mm. And it's just a little, your mind's a little more clear headed and it's all natural. There's nothing. You know, you don't take anything extra or anything with it, but uh, yeah, just something to. How'd you How'd you feel after doing the? the I felt super relaxed. Yeah, mm. I felt relaxed. I felt like I had just gotten massaged again. I felt like more more clear headed. Yeah. I could think clearly, so that was that was nice. But things like that do help. Music, I love music. What, so, what's your go to music right now? It's top, always it's top. All, you could I I know to put top songs sometimes mm -hmm. is hard. Top three, top five. What would it be? So I'm big on uh, older music, oldies and soul, okay. uh, doo-wops, uh, three bands. Uh, I tell people this all the time, Duran Jones and the Indications. Yeah, that's, that's my number one band right there. I love Bobby Arosa, the Altons, the Sincere's. These are new modern bands that sound, sound old. But I love all the 50s, 60s stuff. I grew up on Marvin Gaye, mm. uh, you know, uh, Sam Cooke, Al Green, okay. the Isley Brothers. I love funk. I'm in my disco vibe right now. I've been playing a lot of 70s lately. <laughs> But um, yeah, 50s and 60s. I I didn't even I didn't even listen to hip hop and rap till after high school. I couldn't even name a Tupac song, you know. And I'm from Orange County. I'm from born and raised in Southern California. Just because I was always I grew up listening to oldies, Dif doo -wops. different environment. Yeah, I didn't listen to hip hop, and, yeah. and now I listen to I listen to everything now. You know, I love 
Blast, you know, certain artists like that. There's a lot of Hispanic artists that are that are up and coming right now. Mexican OT, you know. So I'm, I'm in I'm in the new stuff right yeah, now. Mexican too, OT, so. just bump it every every time you get in the truck, just bump it. Yeah, I like music that makes me cry. For sure. There you go. Definitely. <laughs> Spanish like, music too. Spanish like '90s Spanish music, the Merarios, Los Bukis. What, what were we listening that. to on the way here and been bumping it the whole week? That new artist that. Oh, I need to hear that. It is Javi. Okay. Xavi, Javi. Oh, that music that you're just like, damn, I should I call it now or later? (laughs) (laughs) So everybody knows he's the famous tattoo artist that influencer, as you whatever you guys want to call it, but you've tattooed a lengthy resume Mm -hmm. of influencers, artists basketball uh players athletes in general what has been your most memorable one the lamello ball tattoos are really popular right now it's amazing to see the work on nba 2k for example and uh that's right (laughs) yeah you see the tattoos on nba 2k which is amazing and again you know i i tell people this all the time i'm legacy i'm legacy minded right legacy thinking what am i going to leave behind while i'm gone and those are little pieces of me that i'm leaving behind i tell people that i want to be i want to be a i'm a tattoo artist but i want to be known for more than those things right Mm. i want to be a like a band baller Mm. like a johnny dang somebody that that caters to the entertainment industry and is a part of the culture. Look at the song. It's called Donnie Dang. Jo- Johnny, Johnny Dang. Dang. Yeah. I want to have shout outs and rap videos too. You know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's what I'm chasing. Things like that. So having my work on NBA 2K, for that's example, crazy. they used the Lamello ball tattoo for his commercial and it inspired uh, one of his shoes, which was really cool. So it's the whole rocket theme, which is the tattoo that I did. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and those are just great people. And, and I meet a lot of uh, artists, right? Different people. And you just never know what you're going to get. And uh, there's people that you click with. There's people that you don't click with. And thankfully, the Ball Brothers have been solid people. They're, they're, they're real, just cool, genuine people. Yeah, I think uh, if if anybody watched the, their show on Facebook when uh, Ball in the Family, yeah, when D'Angelo, uh, his dad saw his whole his yeah. whole piece, and it was just like, what the hell? You got dismissed and everything. But you dad have was upset. Lavar was upset. Oh, Lavar was upset, man. Lavar, Lavar's. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a, he's a character, but I mean that's one of the things of looking at him as a dad. He's a great dad. He prepared all three to be where they're at now. I wish my dad was like Levar Ball. He was the Chino Hill from Chino Hills to the what was it overseas yep. to now like Lamelo being one of the top NBA mm-hmm. players in in the nation. So besides them, what relationship can you? S- off the top of your head, can you say spark from tattooing and now just have a, a friendship? I, I'd say them because, you know, I'm getting invitations from Jello to his baby shower, things like that, right? So, you know, there's there's people that I have real connections with there. There are a few examples. Uh, I've told people that I'm, you know, I'm friends with the YBN guys. I've, I, I do a good job of meeting people early, and I think that's why they're real connections too because when you meet somebody after – the big hype, the big success. You never know what you're going to get. So when I meet people early on, I feel like they maintain that same that same person that I met versus getting lost in the sauce and then they're a whole different person. And that does happen too. That does happen yeah. too. But uh, my goal is when I meet people, not just people that I tattoo, but in, in general, I just I like to build a network, build relationships, plant seeds. So I come into, when I tattoo a client, I'm not potential. I'm not tattooing a, a client. I'm potentially tattooing a friend, right? Mm. Because a lot of my clients turn into to friends. We spend a lot of time together, especially people that collect large scale work. Jello, for example, forty plus hours of tattoos. That's a lot of hours to get to know each other, yeah. connect on different things, and that that ultimately does build real real relationships. Yep. Um, what artist player did you tattoo that maybe not everybody knows about? See here, people that people don't really know about Spanish music. I tattoo a lot of Spanish Spanish music artists. Originally, I was known for. Let's do this. I started off tattooing underground rap. 
I started off with uh, Tattoo and Fora. He was one of my first big clients. Um, I actually have a tattoo by Fora, the Yours Truly White Tee. And originally, me and him, we were, we were working closely together, him and his team. And that sparked a lot of uh, interest in my work. I'm so grateful and thankful for, you know, a lot of the, the, sh the shine that he gave me because that opened up a lot of opportunities. Yeah. So after underground rap, it turned into uh, more of a mainstream rap, mainstream rappers. And after that, it was basketball players. And shortly after that, I became a fan of more, more Spanish corridos, right? So a lot of people that, I, that don't know that I've tattooed, I'd say is Spanish artists. So Chris from Tercer Elemento, oh, sure. at the time that I tattooed him, he was probably the it guy, right? Yeah. This was before Nathaniel Cano. So that was somebody that I tattooed early on. Luis Coronel, that's another one of my clients too. Good, great guy. And there's a lot of tattoos that, believe it or not, like, I have a tattoo with him that I've never posted because it's a personal tattoo. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of work that's not out there that I've tattooed. Things that, that are not posted that happen in real life. And Man. those are a few examples of that. Junior Ache, um, which I'm a huge fan of. I got to work on him. And, and I mentioned earlier, you know, his video. I have a YouTube video with him. And that video is starting to trend now. So that's the thing. Again, I'm planting seeds. This video that I'm dropping today might not blow up. Two years, not till two years <laughs> later, right? Yeah. And that's the thing that that when we post, and that's something that I tell all my creator friends or anybody that's looking to get started, post it and forget about it because, sure, a lot of times they might not perform as well as you want it to initially, but you never know what it's going to do in the future. Things do spike and hit later, especially yeah. with today's algorithm. Older algorithms, you'd post something and it hit right away. Boom, boom, boom. We got yeah. used to that. Yeah. Now it's changing and it's a forever changing game. It may, too. It may take a week. It may take two weeks, Definitely. three weeks. It may take... There's a video that I posted, I don't know, three months ago and started getting all these likes. I'm like, what the hell did I do? And I, shit, this was three months ago. Yeah. How you said, like, you can't, you can't be too hard on yourself because that video is not performing the way you thought it was. Let it be. If, the, if you really love what you do, if you love your content, post it because you love it. Definitely. Let it do its work, right? Um, before we, we get out of this topic of tattooing, how did you manage to land these big artists, these big influencers, these big athletes? Because to get that type of resume, you have to have either something special, do something special, or know somebody. So if you could kind of take us through there. Sure. Two, two things. I'll start off with this. I, try, I treat celebrities like normal people, and I treat normal people like celebrities. So I think that's one thing. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm good with all walks of life. I used to work in um, sales, right? And mm -hmm. I got to really, really face my fears with talking to people, especially people that, again, uh, uh, maybe don't look like me, things like that. So just being a sales rep forced me to step outside so I feel like I can connect with people genuinely too, right? Because I yeah. genuinely like talking to people. Uh, the other thing is, is, and I'm glad you asked, how did you start yeah, talking to celebrities? I gave away a lot of free work. That's... One of those things. In the beginning, there's no demand for my work, right? So how do I get my work? I give free service, a free product, right, to get it out there. And in the beginning, and I know that's what a lot of people don't like to hear, but anybody that's, you're doing hair, you're doing makeup, you're, people pay for ads already, right? Yeah. You pay for uh, marketing, things like that. Yep. Why not offer my service for free for the day? So you ask how? I'd message people every day. Every day. I'm, I was obsessed with it. I, wanted to, I knew I wanted to tattoo celebrities. Coming into tattooing, it wasn't... I knew coming into tattooing, I wanted to cater to the entertainment industry. I wanted to be the next, I want to be the next cartoon. Yeah. I wanted, uh, do you know who Mr. Cartoon is? Yeah. Legendary tattoo artist. Yes, 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 yes. When I started tattooing, he was tattooing everybody in hip hop, 50 Cent's mm. back piece, a lot of legendary art pieces, right? Yeah. So I came into tattooing inspired by Mr. Cartoon, the shows that I was watching on TV, and I knew I wanted to tattoo celebrities. So what did I do? Social media comes around. I grew up in the 90s. You couldn't message your favorite actor, your favorite rapper, your favorite artist. No delivery. Today's yeah. time, I can send a DM to whoever, right? Moneybag, yo, and I might get a DM back, right? Yeah. So I would just DM literally 10, 20 people every day, short message, right? Because you want to keep your message short, straight to, to the point. point, right? So I'd message people every day, and little by little, you start getting replies back. And uh, I gave away my, my work for free for, for many years. And those are the things that people don't see, right? Mm -hmm. When your rent is due tomorrow, uh, you know, you're struggling financially. And I get this call to tattoo this big artist who I'm not going to make any money off of. I'm actually going to lose money because I'm going to sacrifice my day when I had a full day tattoo, right? And it's those points that those are those sacrifices and that people aren't willing to take to 
for the for the long road right for that long-term vision and yeah. giving my work for free is really what opened up a lot of doors i think uh connecting with people after that the word of mouth uh reputation that's everything because if you can't i think it's one of those things too where once you're in you're in and uh because every reputation is everything you're yeah. being trusted with phone numbers addresses i was tattooing jello when nikki was pregnant she was at my shop and they trust me enough to you know what i mean i'm not gonna post anything that they're pregnant just reveal these 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 things that are personal there's intimate things that i mean that that's how we, luckily now where we're at too that we we get to sit with famous people people that are very impactful in the world yourself included but there's people like i don't know for us for me i'm not one to brag about it i'm not one to like yo look who's coming today you'll see it on monday there you go you don't need to see it right now like today we'll post stories but I don't need to make a big show about it. Why? Because I generally got a great conversation with a great friend that I get to post about this for this. And, oh, how, bro, how do you do that? You got to take a chance. You got to take an opportunity. You know, you got to before, you know, meeting Chris. And how do you how do we land big people? Same thing. DMs. Comment on people's page. You know, taking a chance. And whether it happened that, that week or three weeks ago, three, three weeks later, I didn't know. I didn't know if I was going to get a yes or no or just left on red or in the request. But it's like, yo, like, what do you got to lose? Yep. Yeah, yeah, nothing. Exactly, nothing. Nothing. Whether we have to go to you or whatever we have to accommodate, mm -hmm. let's do it. Because, again, like, you're doing things for free, but you know the longevity of it. Definitely. You know what's going to come and it's going to sprout after you do it. So if you wouldn't have done that, you know, you probably wouldn't have had this long list of, of people that you've been able to tattoo and have great friendships now because everybody wants the secret of how to become successful. How did you become successful? How were you able to open a tattoo shop in 2011 and now grow your list of, of clientele? So if you can kind of give us, give us that of the how. Putting in uh, my 10,000 hours is, is what got me here. They say it takes uh, 10 years to become an overnight success, right? So putting in the hours on your craft mm -hmm. is, is important. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you put, apply 10,000 hours, right, to anything that you're chasing, it's going to pay off eventually. So that's, that's something that I've carried with me for over a decade is I'm just putting in my 10,000 hours. Man, and no stopping. That's right. I did, that's a, where people are very quick to give up because it got hard i need to give up or i'm gonna stop it's like no dude that's the, that's the opportunity for you to definitely test yourself what um now in life it's it's a roller coaster from it is and, and i don't want to paint the picture that everything's is great all the time either right yeah. because even a lot of people they see me oh uh whatever nba 2k this and that tattooing these people but uh it is it's a it's a roller coaster it goes up and down even now like things do do get hard even especially when you're i'm blessed because i have tattooing and that's my bread and butter but i have full-time creator friends that it's a roller coaster it goes yeah. up and down i'll give you an example i started posting uh facebook reels when reels first became available right yeah i let's take that even before that I see, I'm tattooing people, I see everybody getting internet money. I tattooed DDG, I don't know if you know who that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. He puts me on, hey, I'm making money on Facebook, this and that, and I start seeing my clients make internet money, and I'm thinking, I gotta get in on this too. So I start creating videos too, right? So I start posting on Facebook, and I experienced a, a high on Facebook. I posted right from the start. I didn't even post anything extra. All I was doing was repurposing my videos from TikTok. I was posting them on Facebook, Facebook without the watermark, and in one year, I stacked, I was hitting, I was getting millions of views over there. I still do really great over there, but monet, like financially, they were paying great. So I bought my first house last year because of Facebook alone. So off of my Facebook payouts, I stacked up, bought my first house, which is a goal that I had been chasing for many, many years, right? Yeah. Because when you're an independent contractor, specifically a tattoo artist, a lot of us are cash-based uh, services, right? Yeah. So it's hard to, it doesn't matter. You could have 100K in your, in your bank account right but now, but if you can't prove how you're making that, <laughs> might as well not even have it. It's so like that a barber. Was yeah, exactly. It's like a barber. It's, it's, like it's, a barber. Yeah, so it's always cash. It's always, I mean, some of them are, um, 
our card, but if you do a card, it's more. So you're like, exactly. all right, cash it is. Follow that. So. <laughs> you gotta follow that. Yeah. But but it took a lot of years of preparing to buy a house. That's the American dream. I grew up in apartments, so that was always you know I remember being a child and telling my mom why why don't we live in a house right? So that was always something that that was one of my goals in life right was to to buy a home and again it was yeah thanks to facebook i stacked up saved up all my money that i made that year remodeled the house too which was which was great but fast forward to now they don't even they got rid of that bonus program so if <laughs> i was just depending on views i'd be i'd lose that house yeah, you know what i mean bro, <laughs> yeah, yeah so and that's the roller coaster that i see is with video creators uh, you hear about the ad apocalypse on youtube right mm -hmm. people that were making i have friends that were making amazing money over there and you get used to that you live a certain lifestyle and then it gets cut short and that's why i think we need to do other things right and that's why i, I like to do other things i like to do series so when i do videos People see me, some people know me as a tattoo guy. Some people know me as an oldie guy. Some people know me as a Chucky guy. I use a Chucky <laughs> yeah. doll. So you know what I mean? That's what I try to do is create different video series so people could find me, and reach different, different audiences, and they know me for different things. But tattooing isn't my end goal. This is, even though people see me, okay, Herschel's doing the tattoo stuff. He's, you know, successful, right? I feel like I'm just getting started. I think one of the things is that people, there's always going to be judgment by for the, how you do things and what you do, the way you do it, right? Oh, what well, someone else already did it. Oh, someone else already came up with that. But yeah, but now I added my own twist to it, right? Because we're the first ones doing it now. But a year, a year from now, two years from now, someone else may resurface it and put their own uh, style into it. So <laughs> how do you look at your? How do you come up with ideas to create your content? Because how you said. And for the people that don't know, you're a part of the TikTok familia. Mm -hmm. You're a part of that program, that family. And in order to get in there, I'm assuming you have to be really special and really there. So if you guys, if you could take us through that also of your originality, your ideas, your thought process, how does that come about? Sure. So video create, it starts with my video creation love, right? Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I used to record videos with my siblings. So we'd had a camcorder. And me, we have videos where we do pranks and skits and things like that. And I enjoyed that. And again, these are videos that were shared just for family, friends. Yeah. Right? So as I, as I get older, focusing on work, and I start creating videos for my business, I understood that with a business, I wanted, I wanted videos to go along with my business. And again, yeah. this is before. What I'm doing today is what I've been doing since I first started. That's, that's what people think is I just started doing these videos. I've been doing videos since I started. Nothing's different. I didn't know... And when I was doing these things, it wasn't something where one day I'm going to be doing all these videos, right? I'm going to be getting paid for these. It was just something yeah. that, that I did blindly, and uh, it just it's cool how, how it worked out. But in the beginning, I always did promo videos, and um, I tell people I was doing TikToks before TikTok, short videos, posting them out there. Some of my first viral videos are I used to tattoo in public, so those got traction on World Star, Shade Room, things like that. And uh, that really got the the buzz going and inspiration. So you ask, how do I create or what comes up? How, how do I come up with my content? Yeah. A lot of things happen organically and naturally because I think like that, right? Anytime I'm, I, I feel like I'm just in that mode now where, oh, that's a content idea or we're in conversation and it hit clicks. Oh, that's a video idea. I have a note uh, right now, page full of ideas. So maintaining the balance on, if I know I'm gonna be off these days, I plan accordingly. So there's days where, I know I'm going to edit. I'm going to come up with these videos. I, so planning is everything, too. Yeah. Planning, some things are going to happen organically and naturally that you might record on the, stop, on the spot. Sometimes those things uh, happen, and you never know what's going to hit, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the things that hit are what you least expect. Mm. There's many times where I posted a video where, again, I'm self-doubting myself. I, I sound ridiculous. I look ridiculous. People aren't going to like this, and it ends up being one of my top videos, right? So things like that do happen. I'm inspired by my clients. I'm a storyteller. I like to share stories. I'm, I'm here to do three things. I want to I wanna blow up. I want to give back. And I want to inspire. And those are the three things that, that I always keep in mind. Damn. Inspire. Legacy. Yeah. Legacy. Back to thinking. that same word you keep saying. Definitely. And um, it's uh, we, I've always said this, too. It's like, what can I do now? So when I'm gone, it's, this is still here. Like, I'm remember for what I did and not what I could have done, right? Every, sadly, every time someone passes, it's like, man, they always wanted to be this when they grew up, or they always wanted to do, 
why not now? Like, what's the problem with doing it now? As much as cringe as social media may be, yo, like, it's something that I love. Definitely. If you love it, you do it for fun, you do it for free, and hopefully one day you can monetize off of it. You love something, monetize it, right? You Definitely. can. Anybody can do that. You do lashes, you love makeup, you love hair, whatever it is, you can monetize. Definitely. There's, there's, a, there's a strategy to this. And, and I do want to talk on monetizing too because I think you can't depend on the apps to pay you, right? Because mm -hmm. if you were depending on Facebook, again, they stopped the program, then you're not getting paid. But the things that you can control is when you build your community, when you build your audience, the money is – Consistent, consistent with the brand deals. That's where I think the long-term money is, and that's what I've been chasing. I, uh, I actually just signed to an agency recently, a uh, Viral Nation. I met them at VidCon this this year, and uh, so they're going to help me. They're helping me get brand deals, and that's what I'm chasing: campaigns, brand deals. Uh, I just had an offer from Old Spice, so things like that. I've worked with Rockstar, yeah. and those are the opportunities that I'm chasing. So it's more than more than tattooing. It's Rock Rule G, the brand with another brand, right? Yeah. And I think that's uh people should start thinking of that more likely. I am the brand. Don't rely on the YouTube pay, Instagram pay. Your brand is going to make you money in the long term with brand deals and campaigns. Yeah, what do we say? Day tomorrow, they turn this shit off. Yeah. <laughs> what do you got? Yeah. You know what I mean? They've t if they take monetization off of everything, it's just like, yo, like, uh, it's one thing that it passes through people's head, right? If you have, have 10,000 followers or even 5,000 followers, you have 5,000 potential clients and whatever business you're doing i know people that have forty thousand uh followers and they make about forty thousand a month it's like mm -hmm. bro they're clients whether you have forty thousand or a thousand a thousand people paying you five five dollars a day total up yeah and that's what people chase the heavy back oh i need ten thousand well bro if you get a thousand people and pay you ten dollars there that's you go it. There's a there's a book called Super Fans. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, the idea is that stop focusing on big numbers. I want to get to a million followers, this and that. The goal the goal is to reach and connect with a thousand people. You only need a thousand people to really connect with, and those are you're, that's able to support your dream, yeah. your goals. You only need a solid thousand. Don't focus on a million people. A thousand is where it's at. Yeah. But that's kind of the basis of it. A thousand is like the key number yeah. for like a supportive community. Think just what what we've always thought about social media. We need the million followers to be successful. We well, have a million followers, but you're getting ten likes. What's the problem? Yeah. <laughs> Where's yeah. the disconnection, right? And, and you know what? Here's okay, so tattooing <laughs> rappers, I do want to talk about this is you know, when you see rappers, you see stacks of money or or just people on the internet in general. And from tattooing people, I've realized that a lot of this internet stuff is is fake. You know, you think you're gonna tattoo this this rapper who's showcasing this crazy lifestyle on the internet, and I show up and it's a a straight trap house, things like that, you know, where it's not they're not living like like they're portraying. Yeah. A lot of times the same stack of cash is that same money that they've been holding on to for a long time. So, you know, you get to see that a lot of this internet stuff is, is a lot of it's fake. So I have a, a question that I really, so you're Herschel mm -hmm. and then you're also your identity on social media. What is the difference between Herschel and rock and roll G and, to, and what are similarities? I think Herschel is, uh, or Herschel is, is that, that young artist that would draw and daydream about the things that I'm doing today. That's, that's who Herschel is. That's who my, my family, my closest people know. That's uh, in my natural state where I'm usually, like I said, I'm usually more laid back to myself. When, when it's Rock Roll G, it's go time, it's work, it's uh, non-personal. This is straight, you know, not biz. I'm having yeah. fun with it. And Rock Roll G is definitely uh, uh, more confident for sure. Herschel isn't that confident? Herschel's, con Herschel's learning to definitely be more confident and is more comfortable with, with being Herschel 100%, 100%. Are you more scared of letting others down or yourself down? I'd say both. That's a hard one. That's a hard one because it's hard to say and, and, and say that I don't care what people think, but it, it, it's tough. It's, again, that's one of those things, too, that you have to let go of and, and not, take it, not take it personal because a lot of times when – you know, you see it yourself, right? When something does well, when anything gets numbers, I tell people you have to accept the bad with the good. You're mm -hmm. not going to get – it's not going to be all praise. Correct. So you can't let the negativity uh, affect you and, 
and ruin your shine either. So yeah. you have to accept the bad with the good when it comes to that. And you got to remember who you are. That too. Right? That too. Everybody on social media, if you're on there, people are, people don't want to be on social media because they're scared about the negative comments. It's like, yo, dude, they know you personally? Dude, whatever they said, is that really you? Or do you know they're lying and you know that's not true? Oh, well, it's not true. Well, then why do you believe in it? Right? Why are you believing other people's words when you know yourself deep down inside who you are? I'm a bad motherfucker. It is what it is. You don't like me? Cool. That's a, your opinion. But I know I'm liked and loved by the people that I need in my life. Social media is just for you to see the byproduct of what we've been building. Definitely. Right? And um, so you have a a famous story you talked about in other podcasts and in other interviews where you tattooed 6 uh, 9 Yes. And about the numbing cream. Yeah. <laughs> So for the people that don't know, if you could kind of just take take us uh, real quick on what happened there. Sure, sure. So 6 9 that year was the hottest the artist hottest, that year. Yeah. Hottest ar- artist that year. If you were to ask me who I wanted to tattoo that year, 6 9 nonstop. And I like to share this story because there's a moment in time where I had just dropped off my, my son and my daughter, right, at, my, uh, at our babysitter's house. And I'm driving to work, and I'm playing 6 9s music, and I yelled at the top of my lungs... I'm going to tattoo 6 9 And it was one of those moments where it, it gave me, like, goosebumps yeah. yelling this in my car, you know, like a crazy person. And so to see it actually, like, manifest and do it is, is, is amazing. I still, it doesn't even feel real now, right? Because I feel like a lot of things changed yeah, after definitely. I tattooed 6 9 But um, the story goes, I had been trying to tattoo him for about a year. And it took about a year to actually link with him. I, um, there's a lot of ways that I reach artists with him, I had tried DMing him. It didn't work. I uh, managed to get close to his team. So sometimes you might have to get your in through the team. You might have to get yeah. your in through the best friend, the yeah. manager. There's times where, like the Ball Brothers, if it wasn't through word of mouth, shout out to my boy Ashton King, that word of mouth referral, that Ball Brothers connection might not have happened. Yeah. So, you know, with, with 6 9 a year later, I, I'm aware and I'm watching him, right? I know he's out in L.A. Or I know he's out in Orange County. He, has, he was about to perform a show. And uh, I knew he was in Orange County, and it's all about timing. I knew he was here. I hit him. He responds back right away. And um, originally, we planned on going to tattoo him on Monday. This was a Sunday night. Monday doesn't happen. I'm already thinking I lost yeah, my opportunity. Yeah. And uh, Wednesday comes around. He calls me, and we're on the phone. And he's very specific about me taking numbing cream. He's like, do you have numbing cream? I'm on the phone with him, right? And I tell him, yes, I have, I have tons of numbing cream. I have all the numbing cream. And I really did. I had, a, I had sprays. I had numbing creams. And I was so excited. I packed everything up. And we're on the way to L.A. And as soon as, as we're there, I'm setting up. Uh, he, I'm getting ready to apply the numbing cream. And I start asking my guys. I took two guys to help me. And I start asking him, hey, where's the, where's the numbing cream? And the dude's looking around. Yeah. I can see the panic in his eyes. He, <laughs> not good. He comes to me. Yeah, he, yeah it's not good he, already. He's like, we forgot the numbing cream. And again, like in my video that I put out, I'm really inside, I'm, I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, this is the one thing he asked for. I'm not going to be able to work with him again. Like, it's, it's done That's for me. Right. So at that point in time, I, I, the joke is that I grab regular A&D ointment that has no numbing in it, no lidocaine. <laughs> lidocaine is what numbs your tattoos. So we, we apply this ointment on Six Nine's forehead. I did some tattoos on his forehead. And uh, we put plastic wrap on it. We treated it like we did like real numbing was, cream. Yeah. So we were, we were trying to go for the placebo effect, make them think it was <laughs> numb. And, and that's the story. I, uh, I tricked them into thinking I put numbing cream, and we, in fact, did not use numbing cream. And he was. He was in a lot of pain. He was struggling. Yeah, he's, yeah he's, he's squirming around. Like in my video, you can see him squirming. And he was in a lot of pain. That area is really difficult to work on when you tattoo the face, neck. And, uh, yeah, he was going through it. He was going through it. But overall, aside from that, he was a good dude in real life. Great yeah. person. I tell people that it was nothing but love. Uh, even though he was or is probably the biggest person that I've tattooed, he was actually one of the coolest people I've tattooed. Dang. And sometimes you meet people that maybe don't have as much clout or as big, and sometimes they're, they act, they they have act like ego. they have it. They yeah. act like it. Yeah. And uh, so I thought that was really cool. And for me, being Mexican, Mexican-American, yeah. I really wanted to connect with 6 9 And that was just a, a win uh, for me. And it was a win for my family. And, you know, my family in Mexico, they watch everything that I do. So it's, it, I love that. You know, it's not just about me. I'll tattoo people that my family, that they're fans of, just to, you know what I mean? It's a win for the fam. Which so, one, which one was, would be that one? That junior, like Junior Acha, for example. Acha? That would be one that 
my cousins, they all love Junior Acha. So to tattoo him and was, again, not just a win for me, but for my whole family. And, and that's, that's something that I think it's, it's not just about me. It's not just about me and my immediate family. I'm doing this for Mexico. I'm doing this for Bella Vista, where we're from. So, you know, it's a small town with I, under, I think it's, uh, it's definitely under 5,000 people. Mm. But um, I feel like I'm, I'm doing it for them, too. I want to give, I want to put where we're from uh, on the map and people to know where we're from and, and just set things up for my family to inspire people. They're like, hey, you can do other things, too, right? Yeah, that, and that's what, like, I told you bef uh, before we even started was the point here is you're already, you're at, at one of the highest levels that people see you, people praise you, they watch your stuff, millions of people. It's just like there was a process to all of this, and now people get to see that. Now people get to hear Oh, damn, he gave out free work? Oh, that's what it takes? I've been trying to do... So now people are going to take things that you said and put it into their life and their business, how to maneuver in their content, their content creating, or how to even open a business of opening a tattoo shop. Maybe there's there's guys in tattooing out of the garage, and one day I'll own a shop. Definitely. How did you get there, right? That was my original dream, too, right? I was tattooing out of my kitchen. I was like, one day I want to open up a tattoo shop. So it definitely... Yeah, and I tell everybody, uh, you know, whether you have a business, yeah. uh, word of mouth is, is, is the number one, right? But take advantage of the internet. A lot of people uh, are nervous about putting themselves on camera, and that's fine. There's a lot of people that are like that. My wife, she's just now starting to open up, right? She never wanted to be on camera. But um, so there's, you know, you can create content and not show yourself necessarily, right? You could do voiceovers, things like that, or yeah. POV-style content. I tell people that today... People don't support brands for just the product and service anymore. It's they support the, for the people behind the brand, right? The yeah. story behind the brand. So I tell people, get, get, who are you? What's your story? We all have a story. A lot of times people think, oh, this story is not that interesting or my story is not that interesting. But know your story, know how to tell your story, and story tell. I think yeah. that's the key for, for all, all businesses. I think everybody can agree that tattoos – Say something about you. Tell a story, right? Genesis has dogs on her arm, but <laughs> they're, a bit, they're a big part of her life too, right? If you sure. ask her that story, you have a lot on your body. What does your tattoos say about you? What's your story? A lot of my, a lot of my tattoos that I have, it's all a collection of uh, who I am. A lot of my tattoos represent my family, my background, uh, where I'm from. You know, so the Atlas, this is for Jalisco, right? Things like that. My family, portraits of my kids. You know, I grew up on, uh, again, I love vintage, old school. So I have, you know, Elvis. I have uh, Bob's Big Boy. But the tattoos that, that are reminders for me, for example, when I first started my, my path, my journey, which is one of my slogans, which is Si Se Puede, and I tattooed this at a time when I was struggling, only had a mattress in the apartment, didn't know how I was going to pay my rent, and that's one of those things where I always look, this is one of those tattoos that's for me, so I see it, Si Se Puede, it's to, just a reminder to, to keep going, and I actually first heard that, I think it was like World Cup 98, right? Something <laughs> yeah. like that, where Mexico, we were rooting for Mexico, <laughs> Si Se Puede, we didn't win, I want to see it win one of these damn in my lifetime, man. I want to see Mexico get a, a World Cup win in my lifetime. But uh, that was something that stuck with me at a very young age. So that, you know, Si Se Puede was powerful for me because it reminded me that anything is possible, you can do it, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, those tattoos, my tattoos just represent me, my family, and our, our, our stories, what I've been through. And even though some tattoos are faded and ugly, I like them the way they are because they take me back to that certain time. So Yeah. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring up earlier little while ago the 690 is because you said the placebo effect right where you put on you put on nummy cream so you don't have to go through the pain right if we take it that figuratively what did at one point of your life did you have to do that pretend like nothing was wrong and and to have that effect pretend tell yourself like hey nothing's wrong but your world is crashing did you ever have that type of moment in your life Definitely. And it's something that I, again, just keeps coming back. I feel like the pandemic was a, a darker time for me just because, you know, again, the world changed. And uh, that was a time when, you know, I was drinking a little bit more during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I was going through, going through things with my wife and I just really wasn't sure what was what was going was what was going to happen. So the uncertainty and uh, just being nervous. And uh, yeah, I was I was masking a lot of uh, those dark times during that during that time. We I had was already at a point of moving out, you know what I mean? So I felt like I was going to, 
lose my family, lose my world. And that's something that I want to share too, actually, since we're on it, because as you know, I've been with my wife before everything, right? And as I started getting more attention on the internet, you know, people reaching out, started making friends. And now looking back, a lot of people weren't real friends, right? You start getting lost in the sauce. And that's what happens with a lot of people. And I feel like at that time, I was starting to get lost in the sauce, right? I started thinking like, I'm missing out on this, missing out on that. Oh, this opportunity to go on tour and tattoo here, like I could do this, right? And I started to resent my my family, my wife, you know, because I'm thinking like I'm I could be where I want to be, right? Yeah. And then I, so that was a dark time. I feel like I was masking those, you know, I, I that was probably the closest to I've ever been depressed, honestly. And um, yeah, during that time, it, it also was a blessing because it allowed me to see that I wasn't missing out on anything, man. Mm. You know, when I think true, like my, when I think of heaven, there's this moment where me and my family uh, went on vacation to Hawaii and we're alone in this lagoon. It's just us, the sun is shining, my kids are playing in the sand. And that to me is heaven. You know what I mean? When I think of heaven, that's my happy place. You know, you hear the sounds of the, you know, the ocean. ocean and things like that. And it made me realize that I'm not missing out on anything. The grass isn't greener on the other side. Uh, what I, I, what I have is what a lot of people dream they had. You know, and and it, it, I think that I cleared that up. And I'm so grateful for that because now I know I'm not missing out on anything. And and. Um, yeah, family is where it's at. How how big is prayer in your life? Because you, I know you mentioned it earlier, um, but I kind of want to like emphasize that a little bit more. How big is prayer uh, in your life, and when did that come into effect? Prayer is major. I pray every day when I wake up and before I go to bed. It's it, I grew up Catholic. Grew up Catholic, and um, when I was a teenager, I started getting these these thoughts of. Uh, is there a God, right? You know, so there was a few years where I started believing that I was atheist. I didn't believe a God, right? I didn't believe in God. And I feel like a lot of things started changing for me when I had my DUI. When I had my DUI, I was in jail and we would get our daily bread. So there were prayers that I would read every day and those things helped me get through daily. So that connected me back to uh, my faith and I realized a lot of things and that, that brought my faith back was going to jail, and um, just, again, being blessed and, and thankful yeah. that I was alive and being able to wake up uh, uh, the next day really opened the uh, so back religion into my wh- life. So. What would you say is your relationship with God now? My relation, I'm, I'm close to God. I, uh, again, I pray every day, um, something that I practice daily. So and the practices that you have now with in general with your life, how do you incorporate that with now your kids? Because you said the way you grew up, Six, seven, moving out at 16, 17, and now having your kids, what are you, what's your parenting now for them? Like, what are you trying to teach them? Like, is there similarities that you see with your kids that you're like, damn, I used to be that at, and then some? Or Yeah, no, definitely. Um, we've, we just moved to Riverside, so we're trying to find a, a church in our area. So we don't have, a, like, a home church quite yet in our area. But, um, you know, we, we are, uh, like, all our family members. Uh, we just get together and just communication. I feel like communication is everything passing Definitely. on, right? You know, just the, the, yeah. the main important traditions, treat, treat others uh, with kindness, right, respect, uh, the, the work ethic, things like that, being grateful for what you have, right? Yeah, I think that's why it's important to, like, take your kid. Like, we, I took my family out to, to Jalisco, and they got to see life outside the U.S., right? Yeah. So I think that was uh, an eye-opener for them. And, and that's, that was something for me as a child that I feel like kept me, you know, aware and grounded yeah. because I was able to leave for the summer, come back, and I was able to see both worlds. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, life over there in... And Mexico is it's different. Like, Definitely. if you stay in the city of Guadalajara and, like, I would say, like, the higher upside, like, it's cool. You don't mm-hmm. see much of a difference, different lifestyles. But then you go to the ranchos, you go to the little, the small, the, pueblos. The small pueblos, yep. it's a little different. And even work, like, they work out there for, what, $5? Yeah. Uh, maybe a day. Or even if you tip them 50 pesos, mm-hmm. what is 50 pesos transition? It's casi nada. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, Everything in life, everything that had to happen in life happened for a reason, and it brought you to where you're at now, where people get, not just some people, millions of people get to see you. Is there something that you've always wanted to tell the world about yourself that they may just not even know or realize just yet? It's 
see here. Sorry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you stumped me on that one. There. I mean, something about myself, huh? Hey, you got to just get off your chest. I mean, I think the main message is that I, I still struggle, too. I'm still, you know, uh, or people, they see you. I have close friends right now that are, same thing, creators, right? Mm -hmm. And, I, again, what you see on the Internet is, is you see the successes, you see the wins. And I'm trying to be more vulnerable and showcase, like, not just my, my wins, right? I want to show all of me, all yeah. of me. So I may not show those, I guess you do see it on my TikTok lives, but <laughs> it's, that's why I have a stronger community on TikTok, right? Because yeah. I share my most personal things with, with people on TikTok. But what, what I would like to tell people is that, yeah, it's not an upward trajectory, right? It's going to be a roller coaster. There's going to be times that you're going to want to quit. There's going to be plenty of times that you're going to compare yourself to somebody younger that's getting, you know, uh, that's moving at a yeah, faster, faster rate. Pace. But uh, it's meant for us when it's meant for us. And uh, just, again, love what you do, keep it pushing, and just get your 10,000 hours in. Those are, those are the main messages. Si that se puede. Si se puede, that's right. That's, uh, that, I think that has to just be something that everybody has to remember, even when they're having a tough day, tough moment. Like, um, not even a tough day. Like, I got to really, it's, you're just having a tough moment. There's always, there, every day is it's a great day. We're awake, we're blessed, we're alive, we have an opportunity. It's just a bad moment. Whatever that looks like, hey, just take a, Take a step further. Take one more step. Take a breath. Like, it's going to be okay. So I know sometimes anxiety kicks in Definitely. or your thoughts start going at you. Like, you know, and I always say that, like, sometimes our voices try to get the best of us, but it's how we maneuver with those voices and what we feed ourselves, right? Um, besides the saying, your phrase, is there a quote that you resent with that you just, like, if you could get it tatted right now, you'll do it? Well, actually, I, have, I do have a few. Um, you know, I'm a, I love to create, right? So I have right. the word create. I have uh, relentless. So I think relentless is a powerful word, right? So that's, again, don't, you have to be relentless with it. You have to be uh, obsessed with whatever you're, you're chasing. And uh, I think those are, those are uh, important words that, that I live by, relentless. For, for that young artist that is beating himself up, that he thinks he's not good enough, not confident enough, his work isn't going to go nowhere. What could you tell that young uh, artist that is dreaming of a better tomorrow? Advice for a new artist, I would tell you, work, focus on your craft. Focus on your craft. Again, don't compare yourself to others. In the beginning, be ready to... To be, be expect to not make money in the beginning. Yeah. Let me make it easier. What yeah. would, What would you tell a young version of yourself before, even before your your success? What would you tell that young, inspired, creating artist? What What would you wish you would have told yourself back then, or would have heard? It's going to be all right. <laughs> That's what I would tell myself. It's going to be all right because in the beginning you have all the, all the stresses and, the, and your worries, right? Am I, am I going am to make it there? Am I yeah. going to be able to, to, to fund, uh, you know, am I, am I going to be able to reach, reach that end goal? And there's never that end goal, so. Yeah. Do you wish you would have heard that a lot sooner in your life? Or you would have been told that a lot sooner in your life? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because in the beginning, it's it, it, it's tough. You don't know where it's going to go. So. Yeah, man. But honestly, I conversation, I think, has done as well, man. I think everybody that is following you, that knows about you, that is inspired by you, is going to take a lot of these gems that, that you said from content to life to how to maneuver and the only thing I could really say right now is thank you. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for giving us your time and sharing a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of your life with us and, and everybody watching right now. So no, I appreciate you guys having me. And, uh, you know, I love what you guys are doing. You know, we talk about legacy, right? Yeah. And, uh, what I was telling my, my friends previously, right. Is that what we're doing right now, this is what's going to be left behind. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the amazing thing is, is that we're creating history and when we're gone these are the things that people are gonna watch and uh connect with yeah so appreciate you man thank so, you guys so much if y'all watching make sure you subscribe yeah. you share you like share it with everybody that you feel needs to hear this message and 
It's Toast Life Podcast, baby. I already Shout know. Shout out Toast Life. Appreciate you guys.